Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today we have with us a very special guest speaker, Dr. Mitch Abrams. Dr. Mitch Abrams has a unique perspective on life, and that viewpoint is different from the views of others within the medical profession. His experiences as a radiologist and his observations as a patient following heart surgery changed his thoughts on the profession that he loves. Realizing medicine we, as we know it has a limited scope, Dr. Abrams took a partial leave of absence from his role as site lead of diagnostic imaging at Cambridge Memorial Hospital. He is creating and promoting a new approach to well-being. He launched the Dr. Bird Project, a non-profit social entrepreneurial program focusing on global health driven by music and art. His goal is to create a more holistic model of healthcare and community development by merging Eastern philosophy with Western medicine. As a patient recovering in hospital, Dr. Abrams realized the traditional healthcare model needs a new wave of thought. He believes medicine needs a new operating system based on mindfulness and universal principles of science and biology related to nature. The Dr. Bird Project's project helps explain Eastern philosophy and practices through a Western lens. Named after the National Jamaican Hummingbird, the organization works on the premise that healthcare and community are not mutually exclusive. It aims to redefine global health care and thus redefine the term global community. Dr. Abrams is currently working with universities, colleges, and elementary schools in his effort to create a fun, engaging platform exploring the art of science and art of consciousness. In the process, he's promoting a new understanding of global health and mindfulness. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitch Abrams. Good morning, thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, and uh, you guys are the second uh, group that I'll be chatting with, so hopefully I remember to tell you all the important pieces. So, give me one sec here, I want to, I'm just gonna transition. Just give me one second here. Sorry, again, some. <laughs> there we go. All right. So, what I wanted to do today is uh, give you guys something to think about a seed of thought. Um, and I want to give this to you um, so it's yours to own, use yours to really understand, nourish and cultivate this idea. And if you do, this will grow and it's in, it'll grow into something that will completely change not only your life, but the way that you see everybody around you. Very simple. Um, I've done a lot of traveling, been involved in a lot of kind of different uh, meetings, and I've noticed something, that despite how difficult some of these meetings are, I always find that the meetings that start off using music or any sort of art completely changes the whole experience and always have the best outcomes. So with that being said, I'm gonna play one quick tune for you, because I do find that sometimes it's so much easier to express yourself in a 30 second song than it is a two hour lecture. So. Nobody's gonna, I hope. All right. up this morning, baby, I was in pain, thinking of the world, I wanted it to change, see the children cry, homes destroyed, what polite politicians now they simply deploy, and I laugh, yes, when I hear, I hear people say, yeah, yeah. Life will never change, silly boy, it's got to be this way I say, set your little mind, oh baby won't you go hide behind I say, why don't you go back and baby you can tow your own line So yeah, you spread your wings around me tonight yeah, yeah. Oh, We 
will fly so high, still time, baby, we will set things just right. And you, you spread your love around me tonight. I beg you, listen to my rhymes. I beg you, let me permeate your minds, baby. sing tonight I wish you all most blissful happy life but you're working all the time child baby watching life pass you on by I say hell no here's your chance son take it back redefine the time but don't you sit there baby yeah roll your eyes at me no 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 it is you this blind child hell yeah it ain't me Cause the moment you are there Now you ask yourself the why Just a second you expand Oh baby yes your conscious mind So yeah, you spread your wings Around me tonight yeah, yeah. Oh, We will fly so high Still time baby We will set things just right And yeah, you spread your love Around me tonight Listen to the rhymes Let me permeate your mind Okay, now, now that you guys are all ready, let's get into it. So, I'm going to start my story with going to medical school. Uh, I had a very hard time in school. Uh, I'm, I have a dyslexia. Uh, I found it very difficult to read, difficult to study. Took a, a number of my exams more than once. And I always had this kind of thought that once I was done my exams, once I was making money and earning a paycheck, I'd be happy. Now what's interesting is that because I couldn't read, uh, I was big into patterns. So I went into radiology. And if you think about what a radiologist does, essentially I don't use a prescription pad. I don't use a scalpel blade. What we do is we use Mother Nature's design. We use physics to understand energy and how that energy interacts with your biological energies. I dissect the human body without a scalpel blade because we can understand how to use energy. And what's interesting is, like I said, I thought once I started making a paycheck, I'd be happy. I would find uh, a degree of contentment. And that's not at all what happened. Despite paychecks, uh, I was still longing for something. Um, you know, my attention shifted to something else and I was really dismayed. I was uh, almost to the point where I was really quite down on myself, uh, depressed, despite everyone around me is thinking, my God, you know, you've got the, the world um, in the palm of his hand. And what's interesting is that I can't sit here, I don't expect to sit here and tell you know, people that you know, money is not going to bring you happiness. Because that's almost like saying, you know, after you standing in the desert for a week without any water, and I've got a glass of toilet water in my hand, I can tell you, hey, this is not good it won't taste good, you're still going to want to drink it. I get that. So, I'll leave you with one interesting thought. When you think about money, realize that 97% of the world money does not exist. It's a zero and a one in a computer program. And I can tell you, we're in a very uh, fragile digital world. It's one hack away, one solar flare away that all of this can go away. So everything that we think about money is all in our minds. And I can tell you, and from my experience, getting to that point, it did not bring me happiness. There was something beyond. And it's not until getting there you start to realize this. Now interesting, at the same time as myself kind of realizing this, uh, I found out I had this heart condition. And uh, you might have heard of Athletes that, you know, have massive heart attacks on the field. Uh, I think it was Reggie Lewis on the, the Celtics. It's this condition. You have a big heart. 
hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So I had to undergo open heart surgery. Now I can tell you, that was an eye opener. From being a physician in training for years, you know, 20 years, getting to this point, within my first year of being a physician, I had to become the patient. Now, I came out of that with two big realizations. The first, I started to appreciate that my mind and my body were disconnected. I mean, it's something in the textbooks we don't even talk about. But yet, imagine now your mind trying to tell your body to do something, but you can't. And at the same time, your body, who just went through extensive trauma, is now sending messages to your brain, making you think things. We're starting to appreciate that the mind and the body is a spectrum. You mess up one, you mess up the other. And they're so inherently connected, but yet, in medical school, the medical books, we don't talk about it. And in fact, the second thing I realized is that when I'm sitting there in this hospital, the doctors, the nurses, everybody is just focused on my body. Like I felt like a car. I literally thought I was going into the auto shop getting fixed on. And no one paid attention to what was going on inside. Nobody. And what was interesting is that as I came back from this patient, this experience, I became part of a, I was the chief of the department. I got put into this leadership role where I started working with health administrators, started to work with the board members, and I started to learn, it was like a crash course on how healthcare is designed, who's making decisions, where the money is flowing. And I realized, like, my God, no wonder this system is so broken. I mean, it was just, it's insane. I could spend three hours telling you stories, you're, you'd want to pull your hair out. And what's interesting is that through this experience, you know, the, the hospital would send me off to these different uh, conferences, one of which was in Boston, based out of Harvard, looking at healthcare design. And literally, I spent three days listening about Toyota, about their lean quality management. Lean quality is another word of saying, hey, how can we do this the cheapest, most efficient way? We're going to stretch our resources so far, so thin until it snaps. That's what we were learning. How can we take what Toyota has done and become really good at, let's take that and put it into healthcare. So, I came back from this conference and the CEO of the hospital says, look, uh, we just spent some cash on you here. I want you to say a few words to our medical staff. Can you tell us, you know, three, three points? So I said, sir, it would be my pleasure. I said, you know, first of all, I said, I, I didn't realize this, but we're in the business of making cars. Apparently, we got, we're making cars back here. I had no idea. Number one. I said, number two, we're creating a system in our healthcare that is all about saving money, creating lean management. How can we stretch our resources? Well, unfortunately, those resources are people, the nurses, the physicians, the custodial staff. So I said, how are we going to revive life in our patients when the system sucks the life out of us within five years? We've got no life energy to give back to our patients. I said, that's a big problem. And I said, the biggest thing, though, and the third point I made was that our biggest accomplishment in healthcare and the social services is that we've created the biggest drug addiction problem humanity has ever seen. When a patient comes in, we don't look at a patient, we look at a, a, someone who's going to occupy a hospital bed, a commodity that we don't have enough of. So it's all about saying, hey, the second you're able to, like I get bombarded every day on my work email telling me, you got to send people out, discharge, discharge, discharge. Here's a prescription of 100 pills. Here's all your narcotics that you need. Come back in a month when you're good and addicted and we'll talk about it. This is our reality. So, our healthcare system is broken, is functioning and focusing on a very small, limited component of our health. Now, at the same time that this was all bubbling up in my world, I also uh, found my own passion, music. And it was about six years ago, in the same month, at the end of the month, I was told that I need this urgent heart surgery. The beginning of that month, I picked up my first guitar, for whatever reason. And so, from that, I felt music had this very uh, consoling healing effect on my mind that nobody else was focusing on. And we can talk about that later, but it creates space for your mind. It creates space for you to think and to expand your thoughts. Now at the same time that that was happening, I went with some friends to India to visit some friends. And 
As a result of going to India, I made some connections and started going back to India quite a bit. And I started spending times in these places called ashrams. Does anyone know what an ashram, an ashram is? No? So basically, it's a center for spiritual science. Okay? It's a place where people come together to get reconnected. Now, when I say a, a center of spirituality, I want to make it very clear. I'm not a religious person. This is not about religion. This is about spirituality. Spirituality is all about how to feel connected with your sense of self. How can you feel connected to other people, the world? And what's interesting is, as I studied in these ashrams and learning about the Eastern philosophy of medicine, you know, based on scriptures written 5,000 years before Christ, we start to understand that these swamis, a lot of them have physics degrees. They've studied the laws of physics because they appreciate energy. And we now know that consciousness is an energy, just like any, ener any other energy that we can think of. Heat, speed, kinetic energy, potential energy. Those are all different types of energy. Well, so is consciousness. So, in the Eastern philosophy, they don't make a distinction. They start to understand this new, under, you know, this broad category of energy. And how does that relate to connect your mind and your body? How can you use it to create health? Our healthcare system, the one that, I, that I've been trained in, is very biomedical. It's all about your biology, your physiology. In the East, they say, yes, it's about that, but what about your mind? How does the vibrations that you create through your consciousness affect your body? We can't ignore that. And when you start looking at the old Vedic scriptures, you'll start to see that they were talking about a heliocentric universe millennia before we figured it out. They, were, they talk about quantum physics without, you know, again, millennia before we even knew it existed. The fact is, is that every time now we're starting to look at what these old scriptures are saying in the spiritual realm, spiritual sciences, our genetics, our biology, our quantum physics, mathematics, everything is now starting to eventually catch up to where they have been the entire time. It's validating the Eastern understanding. And this all came about in 2005. The Dalai Lama was invited to speak to the neurosurgeons of America at one of their conferences. And he says, look guys, why are you guys just focusing on disease? Take your machines and why don't you study a healthy mind? Go study a Tibetan monk. Study their brains. You're going to find a difference. And sure enough, we did. Now, Harvard, this Dr. Sarah Lazar, you can Google her. She's on YouTube. She's on TED Talks. She did this amazing experiment that really opened up this whole door. And she showed that any of us can sit and learn to meditate. Within two to three months, 20 minutes a day, we see structural changes in our brain. Literally. The gray matter in your brain that helps you create your thoughts, helps you think, concentrate, deal with stress, that area actually gets thicker. We see it. And we're neuroplastic. We know that even now, you guys are listening to me, you're making new neural connections. You're neuroplastic. You're changing as we speak. I'm changing through my experiences dealing with you guys. Now the interesting thing is, we now understand that the areas that we show that there's been changes, like the amygdala, that's sitting basically in the middle of your brain. The amygdala is like this little ball. It's spitting out all these hormones that make you stressed. It's like your fight or flight. And it keeps us in this state, of, this grumbling state of anxiety. And it keeps us at a very close to this tipping point where if something happens, you react. You'll burst out. You find yourself in this pattern, like a reflex. You know, you might say something you didn't mean, or you might act out, get yourself in trouble. That's your amygdala. And you realize that in about two to three months, the amygdala shrinks. All those hormones start to decrease. So now you feel more calm. And the way that people are now, I mean, look, you've got to appreciate, there's no English words for a lot of this stuff yet. This is all Eastern philosophy. But people say, you know, how to describe it? Imagine yourself as being a cup of water. And the stress of life, like a tablespoon of salt being dumped into that cup of yours, you get salty, you know, so salty it gets nauseating. But imagine when you meditate, because of all these changes, you become like in the ocean. And that same tablespoon of salt, that same stress that's always going to be there, doesn't affect you. You know how to deal with it. 
It's always going to still be there. But now your mind doesn't get so twisted around it. You start to see life differently. And it's not just because, oh, you feel relaxed that day. It's because your brain has structurally changed. And in fact, our genetics is now showing this. I can tell you, it wasn't that long ago that I was studying in medical school. My genetic textbooks, they're, they're irrelevant now. Before, I, I was taught that what I was born with is what we're going to be dealt with. A is going to give you B. It's in your genes. Well, now we're starting to understand that's not the case. In fact, that is the smallest component of it. The big picture is now saying, hey, what you're given, how much of it are you going to turn on and how much of it are you going to turn off? That is the essence of who we are and what we are and what we're capable of. I mean, it's, it's completely revolutionizing healthcare. And we now know that when you meditate, the good genes that creates good things in you get turned up 17 times more than when you don't meditate. The bad genes that causes stroke, causes cancer, heart attacks, that gets down-regulated seven times. So what we're talking about, folks, is not just something like, oh, you might find a 2% change in your health outcome. No. Like, this is like equivalent to smoking 30 years, you know, two packs a day for 30 years. This is so profound to our health. And what's interesting is that this is now opening up a brand new door. We are now understanding that the science of mind that the Dalai Lama talks about is on the exact same spectrum as Hawking's, Einstein, talking about the quantum physics, the mathematics, our biology, our genetics. All the hard sciences are now fusing with the soft science of spirituality. It's completely revolutionizing the way, not only the way that we see ourselves, but the way that we interact with each other, the way that we see the world, how we interact with each other. It's all new perspectives. There's a brand new door that each and one of you can walk through. And we can sit and talk about it. You can know that the door is there, but until you walk through it, that's when you're going to create any degree of change. And what this is doing is that this is rewriting our healthcare books. This is the biopsychosocial model of healthcare now. So what that means is when Johnny comes in, because Johnny's got a tummy ache, yes, we have to look at Johnny's, Johnny's stomach, his biology, but we also have to figure out what's in Johnny's head. Because if Johnny is super stressed, well, we now know that's going to cause an ulcer. You've got to get into his mind. But even more importantly is that blue circle. That blue circle, that social, that means community. That means if I need to heal Johnny, I could ask Johnny, hey Johnny, what's your family life like? What about your friends? Because if the people around Johnny are not healthy, Johnny's not going to be healthy. If everyone around Johnny is stressed out, that is going to resonate and get absorbed in Johnny, and Johnny's going to maintain his stress. If everyone around Johnny is drinking booze and eating Kentucky Fried Chicken every day, well, I can guarantee you, Johnny won't know the difference, and Johnny's still going to come in a week later with stomach issues. So, our understanding of healthcare has now focused not just on you as the individual, but you as part of your community. So, we define health now as you are the extension of your community, and your community is an extension of you. That is Eastern philosophy. So, this whole understanding of that blue circle your community and how it affects you. You know, I call it social capital. How connected do you feel to yourself, to the people around you? Because studies have now shown that the biggest risk factor for death in the retirement population is a sense of isolation. If people feel isolated, you may as well have smoked your entire life. You have just as much of dying from a stroke, from smoking cigarettes all your life, than you do loneliness. And the opposite is true. The more connected you feel, it has a protective aspect on your health. We are a social species. That's what we evolved to be. That's what we are. And we now have research, hardcore scientific evidence that shows us this. So it's all about how we feel connected to each other. Now, the interesting thing is, folks, we're starting to see all of this stuff. We're starting to understand that, wow, here's this new door. The world's not flat. We're at that same stage now where we're starting to understand that the universe is not at all the way that we thought it was. Now the thing is, I don't want people just to accept this fact. I want you guys, each and every one of you, to understand it. 
So it becomes yours, again, yours to own and yours to walk through that door. So, how are we going to do that? Da Vinci said, everyone needs to learn how to see. Everybody needs to understand that we are connected. Everything is connected to everything else. Okay? Now, what in the world does that mean? We'll take one step back. Nikola Tesla, very smart dude. He, you know, he figured out electromagnetic waves, electricity, all of this stuff. He's brilliant. He says, look, to understand the universe, you have to start thinking about energy. Everything's a frequency. Everything's a vibration. Everything. This seems pretty solid in my mind, this podium. But you know that this is a 99.9% .9 vacuum. There's nothing here. We know this. Quantum physics has made this extremely clear. Quantum physics is not wrong. Everyone's smartphone, everyone's GPS, everything that we live our world around is based on quantum physics. This is not real. But we need to start thinking in terms of opening our minds to this new understanding. And so, how to make us understand that everything is energy? Think about when you go into a dance hall or a music festival and you see 10,000 people dancing. Well, no, everybody has a different dance move, right? Everyone's got a different maneuver. But everybody is synchronized to the same beat. There is something that keeps us on that same beat. Now, the universe is no different. There is a frequency that's beating at the arms, at the level of our universe. If you look at the arms of the galaxy, and you look at the clouds of a typhoon, it's the exact same geometry. It's the same rhythm. And in fact, when you start looking at Mother Nature, every flower petal, every snowflake, bolt of lightning, everything is the exact same geometry. There's names for it. You can call it the Fibonacci sequence. I don't care. The, the, the labels does not interest me. The fact is, you need to recognize it. And you start to appreciate that the patterns that you see in a tree is the same pattern as you see in their individual roots, the individual branches, individual leaves, even the veins in that leaf is all the same geometry. It's all dancing to the same beat. And when you look at yourself, well, guess what, folks? Our entire anatomy is based on that same geometry at every single level. You can't escape it. And what's interesting is that when the next time you pick up a leaf and you look at the veins flowing through that leaf, now look at your hand. It's identical. You have the same geometry. So we're starting to understand that our relationship with Mother Nature is that we are the extension of Mother Nature. We find this geometry everywhere, it's even down to our biomolecular level of our DNA. Okay? And what's interesting is that we just completed, about five years ago, the Human Genome Project. We've mapped out the genes. And guess what? We're over 99% genetically identical. Think about it. And we're talking about millions and millions of genetic you know, material. 99%, I mean, essentially, we're identical. You know, we are shifting to this understanding that, look, you, little Johnny, is a super organism. Johnny's made of a thousand trillion different cells. Each cell has got about 10 bacteria hanging off of it. You got 10 times more bacteria making you than your own cells make yourself. Now, all of these cells are working in different communities might be the community of the heart, a liver, a stomach. And all of those communities work together to make you, you. You're a super organism. And what's interesting is that we're all genetically identical. We all have the same fingerprint, same design. We are Mother Nature's individual brain. You cut off that tentacle, and it'll still start navigating through the environment. It won't go very far, because you've just lost the mother brain, but it still can function. Biology and life take on so many different forms. That's evolution. 
And just as you can look at the octopus and think, oh wow, that's a really weird organism, well, Mother Nature is also really weird. You know, you and I, we think of ourselves as being humans, but if you want to think at another level, we're really the individual brain cells in Mother Nature's complex brain. Just like how there's a brain in every tentacle, we're each an individual brain. You take collectively our brain waves and you make one big brain wave, that's Mother Nature's brain wave. This is where we're headed. This is where science is taking us. We need to start to understand it and embrace it. Now it's interesting because what we're talking about is I'm saying, hey, we figured out Mother Nature's fingerprint. We figured it out. It's the Fibonacci sequence, golden ratio, whatever you want to call it. It's a certain geometry, a pattern. And what's really cool is that when you start to understand these patterns, you start to appreciate that all of these patterns, these patterns are identical. They're all mathematically first cousins to each other. And they all represent Mother Nature's design. Some of these pictures might be a two-dimensional representation. Some of them are three-dimensional. Some demonstrate how a flow, a dynamic flow, would flow through one of these geometries. But essentially, I don't want to get down the rabbit hole, but guys, what you're looking at is the fingerprint of Mother Nature. Okay? Why is it so important? Because not only are we going to start recognizing this more and more in the physical world, but it also helps us understand what's going on in our subconsciousness, in our little brains. Because it turns out, when people's faces fit this nice geometry and this nice rhythm, the more attractive they're going to be perceived by the public. Meaning, not only is our physical bodies and the physical world being evolved around this certain rhythm, but our minds, our subconsciousness is attracted to it. We like it. We have an affinity towards it. If you go, anyone here interested in marketing and design and graphic design, you'll be learning Fibonacci in your first week because in their textbooks they know this is very appealing to the human eye. No one's really figured out why. They haven't put all the pieces together, but now we have it. It's because this is what we've evolved around. This is what resides in our subconsciousness. And what's really interesting is that as we look more for these patterns, we'll find them. This is an amazing study. Think about this. A colony of ants. A colony of ants function like one super organism. They do insane, crazy, big things. But Johnny the ant doesn't understand A to Z. Johnny only understands A to B. Okay? But what's really interesting is that when you actually look at a colony and how the colony together makes a decision between a new home, A or B, the physical distribution of that colony of how it makes that decision is the exact same flow as the electricity that flows through our brains when we make a decision. We're starting to appreciate that these patterns in Mother Nature continually are repeating themselves. They're continually being found at different areas, different levels of our consciousness. Okay? So, just like how we're kind of like Johnny the Ants, right? I don't, we don't understand A to Z. We only really see A to B, what's around us. But what's interesting is that I really believe we're kind of like Johnny the Neuron. We're each individual neurons in this complex neural network. And that's what we are. That's what the system that we live in is. And so once you, we all understand that there's a frequency, a rhythm that flows from the spiraling arms of our galaxy all the way down to our DNA, I believe it's time that we tune our minds into this frequency. We need to be made aware. Because I can tell you, what resides at our level of subconsciousness, once you bring it to a level of awareness, is very empowering. You can start to use it, observe it, and you can start to expand on it. To not only create health, we know that we can use this to create a very sharp mind, right? Strengthen the mind, we know this. The mind is like a muscle, you can learn how to flex it. We know this. We also know that this certain pattern has been used for millennia. You know, architects have been using this geometry. You look at every cathedral, every mosque, every temple. It is that geometry. In fact, Nobel Prizes in the areas of science are now being given to people 
who are now using Mother Nature's design. This is the buckyball, 1996, these chemists, they were given the Nobel Prize because they found it in Mother Nature. They're now finding this in clouds of gas in different universes, billions of light years away. It's so inherent to our existence. Graphene. Does anyone know what graphene is, nanotechnology? I'll tell you, yeah. This is 2010 Nobel Prize winner for physics. This is carbon. They make a thread a thousand times thinner than your strand of hair, but yet it's 200 times stronger than steel, it's the most electrically conductive product we've ever created, it's literally broken every world record for construction material. And what is it? It's literally just carbon. Now carbon can be stitched together to make a chunk of lead, a piece of coal, a diamond, but if you use Mother Nature's fingerprint, you get nanotechnology and you create a miracle product. So this is called biomimicry. Let us use Mother Nature's design to solve complex human problems. So, my point is, is that if we are now creating systems and using Mother Nature's design in all sorts of different areas, why are we not applying it to the social sciences, creating health, and why are we not innovating communities? Get people to work smarter and more efficiently together. Because all of our research now shows us, hey, if you're doing shift work, anything over six hours, you are now a detriment to yourself. You're putting everyone around you at harm. You know, in the nursing field, this is uh, the biggest thing. Psychiatric rates exponentially increase. Car accidents, suicide rates. But yet, when this paper came out talking about six hour shifts, the hospital went from eight hour shift to 12 hours. Completely ignored the data because it's all a financially driven program. So I believe that we now understand this rhythm, this frequency of Mother Nature. Why are we not applying it to create new communities, new programs? And more importantly, how can we use it to create individual health and healthier communities? So I can tell you, I've been working on this program and I've been uh, approached by a number of marketing companies. And they're like, dude, you got a multi-million dollar product here, an idea. Let's work together. Let's create this. And I've refused them. And they think I'm crazy. Because I told them, I said, you know what, uh, I want to actually do a program working with students. You know, I believe that they need this more and I think that they can do more with this than you guys can. And they think I'm nuts. And one group even told me, he goes, you know, you're so insane. He goes, you know, you're going to give this to the millennials and, and, you know, look at the millennials. He said, you know, they don't care. They don't care in any of this. And I'm thinking to myself, and I told this guy, I said, you know, I, I can't agree with you. In fact, I think that they're very passionate. I just don't think that they give a shit about what you think about. Because I think they're awakening to the understanding that the system that we've been playing, the rules were made hundreds of years ago at a time that we thought we understood the way things worked. Now, unfortunately, this monopoly game has been stealing your future, our future, stealing our environment, our financial security, even our overall security. You know, the fact is, is that millennials are awakened to this and they don't want to continue on with a system that continually makes us sick. They get it. And most importantly, I said, you realize that, and I was talking to this guy, I said, you are going to be depending upon the millennials in 20 years from now. You guys are the future. I don't know if you guys realize this, but when you guys are my age, and I'm not that old, when you guys are my age, you are going to be the 25% of the global population that will be working and supporting the rest of the world's population. Over 65% of the world in 20 years from now is going to be retirement age. They're not working. Another 10% is going to be young kids. So guess what, folks? This now falls on your shoulders. There's no way of escaping it. This is it. And what's really making me nervous is because as happy as these guys are, are, look like, we know, all of our data knows that we have a mental health epidemic. The American Medical Association says, hey, anyone that comes through your doors, you have to do a medical uh, mental health screen. Our suicide rates are exploding. This is a huge, I mean, any, everywhere you look in healthcare, this is a primary topic. And the problem is, 
is that we don't know how yet to really get a hold of it. And you guys are the future. So it's become a real issue. And it's not just you guys, it's everybody. But unfortunately, you guys are our future. You are the future. And I believe that you guys have the greatest potential energy. You know, the greatest potential. And in fact, I believe, my heart of hearts, there's enough potential energy just in this room that if you're given the roadmap for change, we could change the world. In the world of social media, when you go from zero to hero in one day, and you guys understand this, you guys were born into this world of the internet. Your neural network is to totally tied in to understanding social media. My parents, completely out to lunch. I'm somewhere in the middle. But you know, this is the reality. You guys have all the potential to create whatever you see that you want in the world. The problem is though, how do we get ourselves to be healthy, to point ourselves in the appropriate direction? Now, I believe that using art, using music, that you can educate, you can engage, connect, resonate with people. I truly believe that by you guys looking at this stuff, thinking about what I'm saying, this seed of thought will cultivate. For those that care, those who want and understand, say, hey, I can be better, I can get over all of this stuff, I want to. This is a program that you can empower yourselves, empower each of you, empower your communities. And that's where the Dr. Bird comes in. So the Dr. Bird's a charity, it's part of a larger social entrepreneur program, and it's all about showing us how we're all connected. And what we're doing is we're creating a very musical, artistic festival, a, a culture, a movement that is designed through the art to educate people on this new realm of how the hard and soft sciences are merging. How does that connect you with your body and your mind? How can we use it to create communities that not only heals, but allows you, the participants, to basically live your life through your own passion rather than having to chase it for cash? That is where we're going. It's all about helping us understand that we are a global community, a global consciousness, an emerging consciousness. And it's there. I can tell you by traveling around different parts of the world, there are social ecosystems bubbling up everywhere. And so a big part of the Dr. Bird, I'm starting a radio program, we're going to be connecting all these conversations under a single brand. I'm engaging you guys to say, hey, who wants to be part of this? Who wants to help rein in our next phase of evolution. And now up to you. I've got people now writing about it, that's their thesis. So now we can say, hey, if this works, wonderful. We're documenting a change. If it doesn't work, well, we're also documenting it. So nobody can ask 20 years from now why we didn't have a chance, why we couldn't turn the corner. Those are all answers that will be, have to be answered by each and every one of us. Now, this program will help us understand the rules that we play by today are completely outdated based on a financial system that really doesn't exist, but what it does do is it helps divide. It de helps conquer. Now the problem is this. That blue circle and the biopsychosocial model says, hey, anything that creates divide creates disease. It creates disease in your community, which then transfers onto you. This is our reality. At the same time, we now understand, look, BPS, our biology, our psychology, our, our state of mind, our communities, that's one spectrum. The blue triangle, it all supports each other. Dr. Bird says, hey, community and healthcare are really the one and the same. Why are you going to go treat HIV patients with pills when they don't have any food, nutrition, any clean water to support that pill? Your community, why are we, it's really one and the same. And music brings community together, it's a healing, we have all the science for that. So that also, in itself, supports each other. So the Dr. Bird says, hey, why are we not creating systems that support each other? Create new designs. Instead of that pyramid, where you know what runs downhill, create a system where there is no downhill. In fact, what we're doing is we're using the geometry that we now know exists, we know that is authentic, why are we not applying it to our social systems? Innovate social infrastructure. Innovate community. Redefine education. Redefine healthcare. Essentially, I have clinics earmarked in Jamaica and India 
different parts of the world saying, hey, if you have interest and you got kids that want to come down and be participating in this new global health program, by all means, bring them down. We'll work with you. We'll create a whole musical program where you come down, we'll help you find your passion. We'll help you live your life through your passion. But at the same time, you're going to be learning and you're going to be working with communities, help healing them at the same time. A whole new experience, a new design. Holistic, mindful, proactive. Proactive, big. You know what we do with proactive health today? We put pamphlets in our family doctor's offices so when you're already sick, you can read them while you wait for your doctor for three hours. That's proactive health care today. So we need to redefine how we do all of this. Now, ultimately, the Dr. Bird says we're going to create a brand. A brand of oneness, a brand of connectedness. And really, we're creating this marketing campaign through radio, social media, and like live events. We say, hey, this is the big bang of consciousness. We figured it out. We've turned the corner. You know, this is, if there's ever a chance to break through a mental cocoon that we have been dealt with, we've been born into, you want to break through, you want to see what's really out there, we need a new tangent of thought to get us out of this hole that we're digging ourselves in. Now, I'm going to shift gears because I believe that talking about mindfulness, talking about it, is the first part. You've got to be educated, you've got to know that there's a door. The question is now, anyone who is motivated to walk through that door, you have to learn how to walk through it. Hence, you have to be given the tools of how to meditate. Now, luckily, meditation is extremely, extremely simple. I mean, it's so simple. But the question is, what is it that you're connecting to? What is mindfulness? Well, I can tell you, mindfulness is very simply how to learn how to be present, how to be here, right now. And so what we're going to do is... Uh, we have to figure out how to unleash your past and open up to a new future. Don't worry about the what ifs. You can't think about what happened in the past. Be here today. So the Swamis say, you know, each of you are a painting, a masterpiece. Everyone's picture is unique unto itself, okay? And what happens is everyone's picture is specific to you. What we have to now understand is that you are not the picture. Your ego is the picture. Your mind connects to all your possessions. All the thoughts that who you think you are is only a fragment of your ego. You are nothing but a blank canvas. And in mindfulness, through meditation, you learn how to separate the paint from the canvas. You begin to observe the paint and you start to appreciate, wait a second, this is all fragment. This is all my mind. And when you get really good at it, you can learn how to paint new pictures. You paint new patterns. This is where health comes from. We get to learn how to become observers. So, how do you do it? It's very simple. Uh, I'll tell you this. Meditation, there's all sorts of different tools. It's like going to the gym. You have all sorts of different exercises. I'm going to teach you one push-up. One push-up that will give you an idea of how that mental muscle works and how you can now go to start going to the gym yourself and making your own routine. Okay? So very simple posture. Simple. Just kidding. <laughs> so, try this now. You can do this in any way, but if you like, sit up in your chairs, just like that monk, and you see that your back, set your back up straight like a board. You got your head, pretend there's a string pulling you up. Now wake up, everybody. Now, unfortunately, we don't have much time left. We don't have much time, so I'm... I want to make sure that you guys really get this, okay? You have to, when you're in your posture, the key is you have to be silent. You got to have no distractions. And all you want to feel is the stillness of your body, okay? I know it's very hard in the room because there's going to be lots of giggles because this is all new, a new experience. But when you do this, for those who want to make this change, go somewhere, my practice, in the morning, I use the can. Next thing to do, I sit right down, I meditate. Five minutes. I started off five minutes, now I'm up to like 20, sometimes 30. But you know what? Even if it's two to five minutes, you're creating health right away. Find somewhere nice and quiet. You can sit on the floor, sit in a chair. If you're in a chair, everyone's feet planted on the ground, 
back like a board, straight. That power posture, interestingly, also sends signals to your brain, tells you that you're more confident. Like, this is the interplay between our mind and body. It's subtle, but boys, once you recognize it and you know it's there, you empower yourself. So, everyone's got the posture, okay? You're going to realize right away that your mind's full of thoughts. It's exploding with tons of thought, okay? The key, we need to quiet the mind. We need to make it nice and quiet. Now, the thing is this. The mind is like the ocean, okay? Every wave is a new thought. That's human nature. You're going to be consistently, continually bombarded with thoughts. Meditation through these push-ups is to help dampen those thoughts. Now, how do you do it? The key is this. You need to connect with your breath. The breath is everything in meditation. It doesn't matter what type of meditation. Once you learn how to breathe, that's the common aspect of it all. So everybody, this is called belly breathing. Put your hand on your stomach. Now, I want you, everyone to take nice deep breaths in and out on your own time and feel your stomach expand and then collapse. And if you like, it actually helps if you close your eyes and just focus on your own breath. Don't worry about other people next to you. Don't worry about other people if they're loud or if they're quiet. You're listening and you're feeling your own breath. So as you take a deep breath in, feel how light the air is coming into your lungs. Concentrate on your lungs. Deep breath in through your nose. Deep breath out. Breathe in. And you breathe out. Now, everyone breathes without thinking about it. The moment you put your thoughts to it, it will actually help you train your mind to get into your body. The key is this. You have to feel it. When I'm breathing, I'm not thinking about you guys. I'm not thinking about what i got to do next. I'm actually thinking about my stomach. How does it make it feel? I'm thinking about my lungs, how it expands and then collapses, how light it makes me feel. I'm feeling the air pass through my nostrils. It's all about feeling your breath. Now, once that happens, you start to notice that these thoughts come in and out of your brain. You just have to recognize them as a thought. You say, oh, here's another thought, and just let it go. Here's another thought, let it go. Always come back to your breath. And I'll tell you, this is a trick that a Swami taught me and has changed everything for me. This is the push-up. The Om mantra. Om. Not to get too deep into it, but Om has a frequency of Mother Nature. It means existence. On your exhale, when you use that mantra, at first it's going to be hard. It's going to be nice and quiet. But eventually, you, you say it as if your neighbor can hear you. You say it as if the world can hear you. Only in your mind, nothing's coming out of your mouth, but on every exhale, it says, Om, Om. And I know it sounds funny, and you guys are going to giggle, but I can tell you, that is what causes your genetic material to change. So, this is that mental push-up. And if you look in that top graph, that's a frequency analysis to show you in the beginning how choppy your mind is, how it's a little difficult. It's not so easy. But within three days, three days of sitting there for five minutes practicing OM creates a solid, uniform vibration in your brain. That helps you. That's what's causing health. So, I don't know, I don't know if we have time to uh, do a little... No. 30 seconds. Okay. So, just to let you know, this is something that you guys need to practice every day if this is something that you want to do. It's not something that you can do once a week and think that it's going to create health. It's a practice five minutes a day. I don't know, people tell me, give me excuses. I'm like, you can't be that lazy for five minutes in quiet solitude. But essentially, we're creating a new network of consciousness. Okay, folks, we'll do it real quick. So everyone sit up straight. And I want everyone to try something really different. Try closing your mouths. And let's see how silent the room can actually get, just listening to breath. So everyone close their eyes, close your mouths, and breathe. Take a deep breath in through your nose, feel that breath, and then slowly let it out. Don't worry about your neighbors, don't worry about other people in this room. All that exists at this moment is you. 
You take your deep breath in, you feel the air, how light it is, and then you just let it out. Concentrate on your belly. Concentrate on your breath. Don't worry about yesterday. Don't worry about what you have to do. Don't worry about lunch. This is the only time that exists right now. Now when you're ready, as you become more relaxed, and you're taking these deep breaths in, on your exhale, start chanting Om. Say just Om. Now, only in your mind. Not only in your mind. That Om, I want you to start yelling it. Try, uh, only in your mind. Silent. Silently loud. Think of that. Silently loud in your mind. Now, for those who want to try it for like 10 seconds, you might feel that vibration that I'm talking about. And why is that vibration so important? You realize when you come and see me for a kidney stone, we use sound waves to crush it. So the sound that you're making in your mind is a vibration that creates health. So, I know it's very hard here with the giggling, chatter, but if you want to create health and you want to kind of connect with something, this is something that we all need to practice a few minutes a day and then it'll just keep expanding. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Mitch Abrams, for that really engaging presentation. So please accept this gift as a token of our appreciation. Let's give another round of applause.